that's third place. What do you say? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. 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 And then I noticed, um, I had a friend who was a king for a day. Hold that pose. The properly oh, eminent yeah, and regarded yeah. Susan Suntry, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay. Now, coming in to pitch for Brooklyn. Show Martin. Well, get her for questions. Yes, got it? It's a wrap. Print it. All right. How do, what to do with the flowers that bloom in the spring, Trella? Oh, he's going to take them and put them in the okay. I know there are a special birthday, too. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> In the medieval theater, oh God, medieval theater, the house carpenter would come out and bang on the stage with his hammer, mallet, carpenter, and that's called a coup d'arche, this blow of the hammer. And it was enshrined in later classical symphonies when uh, Haydn or Beethoven goes, ram, 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 tra -tra 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 -tra. okay? That was the kudos shake. I see, at that rate of explanation. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No explanation is needed. <laughs> I think that looks pretty good. It's been done. Anyway. Mm -hmm. What? It's been done. Spell D-U-A. And Richard isn't here to uh, be victimized by that. Oh. <laughs> Can't win them all. I have wanted one of these all my life, since I'm three years old. And what this is, is an actual Australian New Zealand, New Zealand Army hat. And they, over there they call it a slouch hat. Uh, I actually got this in Australia. Talk about lifetime ambitions. I think this is the most rakish thing ever produced other than a 1951 Jaguar XK120. <laughs> British Racing Green, thank you. But it is not yet birthday hat of choice. This is my official Captain Stevie of Venice hat, which only meets the daylight on St. Patrick's Day. This is the exception. It has all kinds of iconic totemic tchotchkes on it. <laughs> a, a brief explanation, the Captain's Bars is my professional nickname. Uh, there's a little apple for the big apple, there's a little P-51 fighter plane from World War II, which is a wonderful fighter plane. And, and I don't know, a little thing, oh, a little pin from the Dodger franchise. It's 100th year uh, anniversary. The thing began in 1898 or something like that. So I'm talking to bums coming out here, but I place no, no credence in that. And there's also a thing about fencing from the Olympics, uh, or near the Olympics. Still, not the right hand. Okay. Now I have to deliberate as I stand here and check these things out. It's a tough choice. Oh, oh this? I exchanged it someday for the old rugged cross. <laughs> now, I myself will perform a short segment of two poems and two songs. Okay? The first poem. Gee, that worked well in my mirror too. Oh, yeah, I, I need to read the first poem. Wonderful canon of cow poetry. Now, for the purposes of this reading, we have to understand that we're all, you're all cows. You have to make believe you're cows or realize, and that I'm a cow. The poet, <laughs> reading. Uh, Warren, please hold this for a second and don't look in. Now, for the sake of... Ah! <laughs> I was looking for an air 
airplane. I was going to say, I hope it's one of ours. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that doesn't fit. Yeah. I think it looks better this way. Thank you very much. Calvin. This is the Calpon, <laughs> flagship Calpon. Uh -huh. I'm a cow, you're a cow. Distant hills, the distant hills call to me. <clears throat> Their rolling waves seduce my heart. Oh, how I want to graze in their lush valleys. Oh, how I want to run down their green slopes. Ooh, alas, ooh. alas, I cannot. Damn the electric fence, damn the electric fence. <laughs> <laughs> this poem appeared on my flyer for my reading and performance event on May 3rd of 1997. Um, as such, I've had printed a special retroactive invitation edition, which each of you shall have. <laughs> I would urge you to come to this function right here on May 3rd of 1997, because you will never be guaranteed ahead of time of a completely successful and uproarious function. In fact, I and my ensemble, it was like, got a standing O, as Harry, ne Harry Northup never Never tires of showing, I mean mentioning. So, you will of course I'm invited. I would go, because as I say, it's a guaranteed success, and you will all be 17 years younger. Oh. It's a poem, I think, from the 80s, and it's called Beyond Baroque. It's an obsolete poem. It no longer bears on reality. It may also, which is a very happy thing, it may also seem to <laughs> ill-use gay folks. Nothing could be further than the truth. Not then, not now. In fact, some of my best gays are friends. Some of my best friends are gay. And furthermore, we're supposed to march in the gay pride parade. They have a program called Gay for a Day, in which if you're straight, you march in support. I was all set to march, but I couldn't because my presence was required at the straight chain parade. But same day. <laughs> all right. So here's the poem. Decided. Beyond Baroque. A gray cloud hovers above the fender of the car. The car is a blue Oldsmobile. The rain pours down, not up. I am homosexual and I want my mummy. And how do I know you won't hurt me? Well, first I will start with an original hymn. I begrudge nobody their religion, provided it's not fuck you, do it my way or I shoot your religion. <laughs> uh, so this is a hymn that I wrote, actual hymn, it's called Why Lord or Why? And I will sing it in the manner of hymns, usually, uh, Aka fucking Pella, thus, <laughs> Why Lord or Why? <clears throat> why Lord or Why must there be others? Why can't the whole world be me? <laughs> For instance, who needs fathers and mothers? and friends who only drive you up a tree. When I was born, I was promised the center of the universe to be. So why, Lord, oh, why must there be others? Why can't the whole world be me? Why can't the whole world be me? Ah, women. <laughs> We can hear you. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, we can. Uh, any, it's, a, it's a consideration. I can't hear from Christ. Um, anybody having trouble? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, you are, Linda. I'll attempt to perform more loudly. Is that audible to one yeah. Of all the sayings that folks have that show devout belief, the ones that say that mom's a doll 
may be considered chief. Ah, uh, but things don't always correspond to everything folks say. And in the day-to-day -day real world, it need work that way. Cause you know that some person's mothers are assholes. Tell me why this should not be. Anyone may turn out an asshole, regardless of biology. So the idea that mom's great in a out itself quite a bomb and your troubles will magnify greatly if you have an asshole for a mom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is a poem by a friend of mine and since this is the annual seven Three quarters centennial Steve Goldman Narcissism Festival. Oh. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, mind you, I, I hate narcissists because they never talk about me. <laughs> All right. This is by one Howard Serbin, who is as near to my lawyer as the system will let me have. He advises me pro bono on my ongoing war with my terrible little brother, about which more later. So this is how, how is a lawyer and with an inner songwriter? And this is a poem. And I must explain first that the word moyo is a Jewish word, a Yiddish word. Ow. Huh? Ow. Yeah, ow, ow. Thanks, man. You don't look Jewish. Um, it, it's a, uh, a ritual circumciser. The guy comes around and puts over a little tip of your weenie because you're not, you're not correct off the rack. <laughs> And by the way, Peter, you may know this, the, I understand the accepted surgical version is in three incisions. But the Moyle does it in one. It's a, it, you hate when he misses me. <laughs> you didn't know that. Jesus. All right, we got Moyle code. My mother had a job in a hospital very briefly in an infant neonate ward, and she once held a baby during a circumcision, so we called a Moyle the Moyle. Bada boom. <laughs> this, is, this is Howard Servant. Steve Goldman has a way with words sharper than the knife of a moil. He's an expert fencer, be it epe or foil. He's there for a friend, not cowed by convention or danger. Let's give him the nickname, Venice's Lone Ranger. Rebel, battler, iconoclast, there's so much to Steve, he's got a real big heart he wears on his sleeve. We wish him the best as he turns 75. May he be in good health. May he be fulfilled and thrive. Thank you. But right now, I want a poem that's a real poem, that's serious, because we're all, lots of us poets here, and we are, as you know, the sub minority, the artistic minority, and nobody knows we're alive. <laughs> so I want one poet to read a poem, and indeed to represent we legitimate, illegitimate poets, and a person who's a crackerjack poet, and who, in my perception, is rather new to this bracket, and who writes gems of poems, one of which he will forth with read. That said, please welcome Martin Kameen. Well, you are a... Here's one, which is a... Un well, first of all, a clean limerick that's funny is exceedingly rare. And this is one. We got poets who know what I'm talking about. There was a young man from Japan whose verses never would scan. He said, try as I may, each and every day, I always try to get as many syllables into the last line as I possibly can. <laughs> you got it? Yeah. And I repeat, thank you. Wow, and, wow. Um, this poem, by the way, is the title is Standing Over the Stove. It's really brief. Uh, it's from, it was published this last year in Los Angeles Waterworks, Histories of Water and Place. It's a wonderful book. And uh, it's Steve's birthday present, but maybe he'll let you take a look at it. Hi, Holly. Huh? Oh, sure. All right. 
like standing over the stove. I don't fall over the grass. Just wash your stove. Standing over the stove, the salmon oil in smoke rises. A black iron skillet. Listening to the crackling, wondering how long before to char. Wondering if a Dinglet woman would watch like this. Salmon smoke, small fire, dark water of the mind, live salmon springing, spanning time. <laughs> From the Commissioner of Poetry, Roger Taus. Stand up, Commish. And I can't refuse to come here. Between roads unseen, utterly effaced in the windowless vault of depression, world featureless now, the very air vapor of lead, and immune to language but the iron mandamus of self-loathing. A young man made of wood, shipped from place to place when bodily mobile at all, unable to think, unable to be, needing a warm coat. Shopping, his mother selects a parka, massive, thick, boxy gray, with squares of faint blue lines as overlay, a shapeless, nondescript, shroud-like thing, only very dimly aware he doesn't like it. He has no strength, no will to know it out loud or say it. He numbly assents, no energy to afford for a forthright decision, only the pain, the pain, get me out of here, take me home, let me go to sleep. She says, it will keep you warm. And the Lone Ranger will never forget his mother's face that cold, sharp Brooklyn winter morning, drum skin tight, seemingly flat stretched, pancake makeup in the sun, eyes shining, confusion in stop motion. Mounting terror of the unknown, that it may be inexorable and deadly, hence dread of the devastation of the future, of universal everlasting ruin, and the burgeoning anguish for in her incomprehensibly broken son her love impacted, neutralized, in frantic yearning to be able to save her child, to repair him. <laughs> My satiric mother song here, I wasn't even thinking about this is a legit paying of a sort to mother, you know? Mothers elsewhere. All right, the second poem. Yeah, I can still do it my way. Yeah. This is called The Lone Ranger in Old Age. Three views, this is view three. This is a little sub-cycle of poems showing different character outcomes for the Lone Ranger. He's very old, and he he's, lives in the old hero's home. And um, this is the Lone Ranger in old, in old age, three views. This is view three. It's the most evolved one, okay. The Lone Ranger is sitting in his rocker on the porch of the old hero's home. He appears, to be he appears to be reading the newspaper, but actually he is meditating. The legendary silver-chased Colt 45s are in the institution safe, awaiting disposition on his demise. Yet unbeknownst to anyone, the revolvers are fully loaded with silver bullets that are far in advance of their expiration dates, and the Lone Ranger knows the combination to the safe. The semantic component of his meditation of the moment runs as follows. Was I right to do as I did in life? Cannot a cause be made that the Lone Ranger was a narcissist, a psychopath, a Steppenwolf, an ego-ensnared outsider, a wallflower at the dance of life? I thought not. I tried to live by right thought and action. It was a matter of passion, a personal religion. I I was priest in an invisible church of one. I wonder, but what does it matter? I am at peace. Nurse Titcom, again, the nurse. Nurse Titcom, nurse Titcom has an additional degree in social work. You know, Mr. Range, you've been a little distant and inattentive lately. What is it with you? Do you have a problem with women? Do you have a woman on your back, as is mentioned in the Zen tale? Aren't you a little old for that kind of immaturity? 
Ah, my dear, says the Lone Ranger in a kindly tone, if you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. What, Mr. Ranger? I fail to see. Come on, come on, dear. Come, my dear. Smiles the Lone Ranger. Kindly escort me to dinner. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great close to now. We have a founding poet of the legendary Venice Poetry Workshop Wednesday evenings in here, or wherever the building was previously, for 50 Abbot, years. Abbott Kenny. Abbott Kenny. Two of them on Abbott yeah. I remember. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so, Luis is a wonderful, wonderful poet. I became a great blurbist, El Blurbero Grande. <laughs> when I gave Luis's book the blurb, Luis achieves, wields a gossamer touch to sledgehammer effect. And that's what he does. So uh, let me get out of the way to hammer and welcome El Estimado Señor Luis Campos. Steve at 75. <laughs> Hombre de oro. Man of gold. A long ranger riding the wild world country. Accompanied by his faithful companion. Brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Oh, I got a copy? Yeah, let me give you the original. Oh. Thank you, Louis. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Rod Bradley is an omni artist. He's a published novelist. He's a cinematographer and a movie maker, and oh God. all kinds of Wait things. Wait till you hear this piece of doggerel. <laughs> <laughs> and Rod is, I stand here and tell you this, a great poet. I think some people are great poets. Very, very few, and you can know it, and in your own okay. time. Okay. No, no, no. Shut up. <laughs> and um, I regard one of my greatest poetic feats ever was to get Rod to publish his book, which is called Waltzing Under the Buddha's Gaze. Go in there and buy it. It's good. Take it away, Rod Bradley. Thank you. To El Kingo on his 75th. Oh. <laughs> so how much really is four score minus five? Why, if you be El Kingo, it's a mere trifle, having weathered most of a century, the good old 21st, infamous for its strife, and you, which you've weathered with wit and aplomb as longshoreman and fencer and poet, just a few among the many hats donned, mm. each a noble song sung and still singing strong. You be El Kingo, a.k.a. Captain Stevo, Monsieur Le Goldman. Why, 75 is mere child's play for such a prodigious and generous personage, patron of outcasts left and right, champion of those overlooked. Yes, a mere three quarters of a century ago, he fought his way forth from the womb and cast his stern and comic heart and eye upon the jumbled chaos of life, and somehow from birth lifted his voice on high in favor of justice over crumbs and pie in the sky. Despite all the jabs and backhanded stabs, he sings on, do or die. So here's to the century mark, just around the corner. <laughs> Here's to the poet and bon vivant, bearing the white hat of the open heart. This barely masked man, songs a silver bullet. May you keep on keeping on, having a blast kicking ass for another two score or five. With your epee pen lifted high ho silver, echoing for years to come. Thank you.
put my, I, I have a thing about being born on VE day. So I put down VE day plus 59 years. It's 69 years. So read it and weep. Now, that said, <laughs> and as promised on the uh, flyer, we'll now smoke a celebratory cigar <laughs> with my friend, compadre, and cigar connoisseur par excellence, <laughs> and fine art photographer, and entrepreneur, and wit of astonishing proportions, and social critic, and philosopher. Ladies and gentlemen, am I going to say this? Please put them together, give it up for Bob Robert Roofer. <laughs> Imagine I'll smoke this one because it's bigger, Bob, and um, <laughs> I'm the birthday boy, and size counts, and frankly, having a large cigar helps me cope with my miniature penis. I thought that was going to be a good information. I'm neglecting what I call the zero humor phenomenon. <laughs> Bob, I want you to stand up. <laughs> I'd like to point out that this is important. Throughout history, this is legit now. Oh, how lovely. It's been a long time. Many famous and prominent women have smoked cigars on the sly, of course. To name two, Georges Sand and Tallulah Bankhead. All right, hey, there he is. Come here, you're on right now. I'm going to introduce somebody right now who is actually a great poet in a beloved but much neglected genre of poetry, by which I mean short, rhymed, terse, immaculately constructed and rhymed, witty as hell poems which are nonetheless trenchant. This poet is a musician on the side uh, who used to know Charlie Parker and who wrote a big number one hit in the 70s. So I would like you then to create an ovation of substance for <laughs> Waldo T. Waldo of Venice, that jiving, geriatric, genuine Jazz man. Jazz man, that's it. <laughs> I had it so well. I, I figured I'd get Wally Holmes! Stay away. Hey, Wally. Hey, Wally. Hey, Wally. We've got no mic. Okay, I wrote this short poem for uh, Steve. Yes. And I'm not a very good reader, but. I need my glasses. I covered all that, Wally. I lost my glasses 30 times by now. Can everyone hear me here? Yeah. Okay. Here's to my friend Steve Goldman, <laughs> who's old, but not really an old man, whose agile mind has not diminished, even though his career is finished. <laughs> Who can turn a phrase with rapacious wit or chew up the scenery of a vaudevillian bit? Who vigorously strode the Venice streets and even drank coffee with the Dewey Street Beats? Whose fencing skills, his thrust, his parry, delighted the crowds, made opponents wary. Yes, here's to my friend Steve Goldman, whose singular life has been bold, man. He's followed no footsteps, invented his course, avoided the pathway to get to the source. One could say Steve strayed from the fold, man, but one has to say he got to the goal, man. <laughs> Thank you. Sign it later. Um, I told you about Wally, and you ain't heard nothing yet. Don't answer. Don't answer. Say Bob. That's fine. Say Steve. You know, a funny thing happened to me on a way to becoming 75 years old. What was that? I was born. How? I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, it wasn't a good idea at the time. In fact, it wasn't an idea at all. But suffice it to say, think what happened when I first noticed the universe and this planet and my family. What do you think about that? 
I'm stunned. You are stunned. <laughs> Speechless. Speechless. I doubt that. Have you no initiating witticism to come up? <laughs> no, I'm just trying to follow where you're going. Don't follow, respond. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, Bob. Hey, Steve. Uh, when I was born, I took a look around. I thought I was on the wrong planet. Why is that? Because of what goes on. There's shenanigans worldwide, historically. Ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Then I found out that I was. I'm actually a Martian anthropologist. Uh, I was left here in a tiny rocket sh ship in Kansas, having survived my home planet. I know that sounds like Superman, but I'm a Martian <laughs> anthropologist. Sounds like Superman. Sounds like Superman. And it sounds like Captain Marvel. Um, <laughs> what was that? Uh, Did you hear Martian, something? As far as I can tell. Well, Bob, how do you think this comedy routine is going so far? Oh, wow, what is that? Sorry, Bob. What's happening? But anyway, in either case, we need something else in this comedy. We need somebody else. Somebody else, yeah. Uh, I'm thinking it ought to be a Puerto Rican. <laughs> <coughs> Say, Bob. Say, Steve. I think this comedy act needs something else. What, uh, what do you think that needs? A Puerto Rican. Wish we had one. That's right. I don't see one. Where are you going to every Puerto Rican's a lousy chicken. You come to chest like a bad out of hell. Someone gets in our way, someone don't feel so well. Hey, quieres introduction? Hey, Steve. Yeah. The act's been saved. I know. <laughs> and you ain't seen nothing yet. I like the island Manhattan. <laughs> I guess so. What is the part of Puerto Rico? Get out the way. I'm getting out of the way. While he's thinking up his next killer, I'd like you to welcome to the stage the poet, prose writer, chef, social critic, and wise ass to the stars, the very rose of Spanish Harlem, making his way into the wings as I said. <laughs> the very rose of Spanish Harlem, El Señor Estimada Beto Rosano! So, uh, what's this I hear you're Puerto Rican? No, it was just an accident, boy. Yeah, I understand that. Listen. My mother and my father, you know, they were, they were like on this little island, and they said, uh, let's procreate. <laughs> Some, somehow, I came out of it. Yeah, you came out of it okay. Yeah. Uh, we still need a little something. What do you think that might be? Thanks, Bob. Thank I think it might be... A bald-headed guy who was a former emperor of Rome. We got one of those. Yeah, the Emperor Constantine. Oh. As in Brendan Constantine. Who needs no introduction? And who quite conceivably can say... <laughs> Hi, Brendan. Hi, Steve. <laughs> well, that's how loud I want you to respond. <laughs> okay, very good. Hi, Steve. Hi, Brendan. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know I was getting called up. That's the one of the fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> when did you guys are great wits and improvise. I assumed you'd all been in a birthday simulator all morning preparing for this. Oh, I have been with this audience. Oh, very good. Okay. Now I suppose I'm supposed to say. <laughs> did your parents actually say let's procreate? Did that? Did that? I sound like uh, actually. I remember it was like. Oh, okay, I was going to say, they, they say romance is dead, and <laughs> let's procreate, that's, I don't, you know, Latinos when they call her mommy, I don't know how that works. He calls his late and sainted mother, mother mommy. mommy. didn't turn her on somehow. I hate that expression, it's the baby Jewish diminutive, mommy, mommy, but this is Latin, and it's, I think it's M-A-M-I, mommy, it's the regular, come on, that was enlightening, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> thanks for the mama race. <laughs> oh, Sorry. That's a good start. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's the best we're doing so far. <laughs> I do like to keep abreast of the time. So, <laughs> so did your mother. <sighs> well, I think nothing goes according to plan. Um, there was a plan? Find cigar. Fine. 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 Good. Yeah. Good. I did mention the miniature penis. You did. You I hope did. you remembered. 
How's the cigar, by the way? I assume you're inhaling half of it as it goes <laughs> over that way. I did make provision for everybody to be upwind of this, and in fact, that's the case. Oh, you're okay. Forgive me. What? It's an organic cigar. One thing that Julie, I had some Beano. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is. Uh, I was thinking of charging like twenty dollars per, but uh, it's free. Oh. oh, I was in a Starbucks the other day. Yeah. I hate that Starbucks and that Starbucks and that Starbucks and that Starbucks. Shut up! Starbucks. I'm in mid joke. Oh. Um, Stay safe. Yeah, Bob. Were you in Starbucks? The other day? That's right, Bob. I was in Starbucks the other day. It was a Starbucks the other day. And I went in the bathroom. And what do you think I found there? Another Starbucks. <laughs> no, Puerto Rican fucking asshole. But <laughs> Let's see. I already did. Chili? Oh, sure. Gay Pride Parade. And, uh, oh, yeah, I went to the museum, LACMA, to see an exhibit of miniature paintings. But I couldn't find them. <laughs> um, in my experience, comedians never laugh. <laughs> Guess that excuses him. Um, so, Steve. Yes, Bob. Were you in Starbucks? Yeah, I was in Starbucks. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but it didn't work the first time. I know. Guess what I found? Guess what I did in Starbucks? What did you do in Starbucks? You do? Well, I talked to the first mate of the Pequod. And we got us a whale. That's a whale with a That's a whale with a Alright. Let's try that again. Yeah, you're right. So, Bob, in Starbucks, I went to the bathroom. Uh, what'd you do in Starbucks? I went to the bathroom. I heard that. I know. What's next? <laughs> well, I went to the bathroom. And what do you think I found in there? Another Starbucks. <laughs> but, um, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want some chili? I got the beans. I think we yes, better get out of this quickly. Chili. I'm, I'm having bouja day. I know this has never happened to me before. Leave it to me. Thank you. That's amazing. Jesus. This is stand-up tragedy, like I mentioned. <laughs> I have some one-liners for stand-up tragedy, which appear in my next book, which is going to be called The Unplanned Child and the light through the crack of the door is slightly ajar. And um, one page is called One-Liners for Stand-Up Tragedy Family Style, which Harry Northup was gracious enough uh, and tasteless enough to publish on his lovely blog. So maybe I'll just recite a few of these one-liners. Uh, in my family, language was brilliantly deployed to prevent communication. I uh, acquired my said to be extensive vocabulary fighting with my father every night about my right to exist. My mother, my brother, and my father and I were all killed in childbirth. Uh, uh, others, uh, um, I feel you. I, I was an only child. Unfortunately, my brother disagrees. <laughs> Oh, from memory. God, there's so many funny ones in there. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we ought to pull a plug on this uh, comedy team. Yeah, my grandfather did. He was a young boy. He did? <laughs> <laughs> I see. He must have got around. Yeah. <laughs> I was dropped as an adult. <laughs> I understand that. My grandfather died quietly and decently in his sleep. The other five people in the car were screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I am brought back this old Russian custom cloud audience. Can I do a quick uh yeah, sure. trying to pick me up? I dropped my sword. Uh, hopefully to end. Uh, a piece about his birthday. Uh, he said to me at one point, and I, I, I wrote it down, he said, to every cross a man to bear. <laughs> but I climbed down because uh, I believe they could use the wood. <laughs> Somebody can reiterate that? <laughs> what a great view, Jerusalem. What? Now, the important part of the body ensues. 
Mill and Schmoo. You're not married to those chairs. You can get out of them, or you can rearrange them. The one thing not to do, and I'll close on this. I was in a movie in 1991, a feature movie, a Hollywood movie. You know, 35 millimeter, I don't, if they didn't have a video then. This movie was set in New York, contemporarily in a fencing studio. So the director, one Jeremy Kagan, had the smarts to get a hold of McCoy fencers with their dowdy white uniforms. And I was drafted. I was too old, short, and fat, but I managed to use some clout to wangle my way in. The guy actually asked for young men and women fencers who were tall and handsome. I had a few of them. So one guy and I went to this movie, and I, this is my inside track on making a feature movie. I never thought I'd see the light. What a, what a big movie, a feature movie is, is it's General Motors for three months. They're just so many people and so much equipment and so much money and so much going on. So anyway, this is what I'm telling us. The movie's called By the Sword. And it's a hokey plot. And I was an extra. I was also a, what might be called a specialized extra. I got a, a non-speaking bit part because I looked old. And I did get recommended for an Academy Award of best bald spot in a rear-facing close-up. <coughs> uh -huh. well, I forgot why I... Why, anybody remember the topic immediately before this? Fencing. Yeah, fencing. Anybody else? Going once. I need to close your non-funny note. And as I said, I have benign cognitive decline. I'm assured that it's not Alzheimer's yet. I also have been diagnosed with psychotic features. I'm delighted. So I wrote a song. I got benign cognitive decline. I got psychotic features. I'm one of those creatures with psychotic features, but I'm way ahead of the game. Oh, schmoozing, the movie, fuck. If you're an extra, maybe some of you know this, you do two things. You sit on your ass days on end. Pro extras bring a aluminum, you know, beach chair and a book and they read away. Or you reenact the same dumb scene 20 times in a row. It's a very strange existence. But the, the God, I got a hold of the story. The director was a smart guy. We were all on what they call a sound stage. It was a room in Vernon where they made medium bombers in World War II. That room was 51 of my strides long by 31 of my longest strides wide. It was an indoor Yankee stadium. But since we're sitting around all this time, and we've got our uniforms and fencing equipment, he says, fence! So we fenced like crazy. I taught lessons, all kinds of stuff. I got in trouble with one, the choreography director, because she had uh, made a scene in which the people playing the fences in the fictitious fencing studio stood in a formation and went advanced like this. A, a sort of kata, if you know anything about martial arts. A choreographed dance thing. This doesn't happen in fencing, and it was just, wincing and she told me what to do with it. Movies ain't fencing. All right, during that time in the sound stage, oh, one guy told me I'd never work again in this town, believe it or not. I said, yeah, this is Vernon, I hope not. <laughs> Honest to God. And the, there were people from all over California, 100 fencers, that's a lot of people, white you from? From the whole state. And what did these people do with these chairs? They formed inward-facing circles per studio. And people were not admitted. They all stuck to it. Like an imaginary campfire was in each of these circles. So naturally, me and my wise ass student, there's only two of us, we can't make a circle. So we would go and point in on these circles. And like any middle-class situation, nobody's going to say anything, Godfrey. So here's more of the story and last remark of this presentation. If you're minded to make use of chairs, don't make exclusive inward-facing circles. Uh, that's not what we're after. It's cross-pollination. Thank you very much.
Thank you from the bottom of my geriatric heart. I need to get it in the picture. You're never gonna. You're gonna. I think we're gonna have to go inside. No, you're course. never gonna get it lit. Um, How about? And, and this way. Did you bring a blowtorch? Bob, where's your blowtorch? This is my mom. Just have your blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have to go inside. Let's go. Yeah. Maybe put it on the table. Maybe that would be. No, it's too. Yeah, and then we can pick the table up and carry. All right. <laughs> Listen, everybody, please. All right, camera. All right. Each candle is 15 years. Okay. Ready? Nothing like that. Yes. Oh my God. Okay, Steve, get in. Get in here before the wind does. I'm just gonna hold this. Let's go. Yay! Okay. The ritual is complete. Welcome, welcome to the club of 75. You keep saying that. Steve, you have to cut the cake. Oh. Steve cuts the cake. Steve cuts the cake. I hold it. Oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. That's a real She broke the cake. tune to. She was just 17. A serious she cake. Hey. Time. I'm going to go get the plates. Wait a minute. Hold on. I think Rod is taking. Okay. Want another cut, Rodley? Yeah, no, that was good. Good. Okay. She was in. Come on, Ellie. I might point out that the cake, the very thoughtful cake, <laughs> How are you doing, Rob? Oh, okay. Hey, good to see you, man. <laughs> are you ready? Should I introduce everybody? Or? Yes, you should. All right. Oh, there's one more thing I gotta do. I forgot. Go. Yeah, go. Okay. This is your birthday song. <laughs> it is a very long. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Happy I want to do one more thing with everybody here. It's very brief. And uh, if people would come and sit close to one another in these seats, it would be optimal for this uh, shenanigan. Everybody, please come over here. Last thing. Now, please. In, in ranks. Okay? Ranks? Can you get a shot yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Everybody in place, please. Everybody visible. Turn around, Get some turf. Get your marks. That's not a bad idea. Get a couple of chairs for uh, Sophie. Turn on the chair. Wally's the chairman anyway. I know. It's okay. Do the best you can to achieve personal visibility. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible. Good.
Steve, you're in the shot, though. You want to be in the shot? No, I don't want to be in the shot. Well, then, yeah. You're out of frame here. Remember? Yeah. Is that my mark? Okay. Now then, here's the same sentence in a slightly different dialect. I want you to achieve a whining New York Jewish dialect as follows. Ah, ah, ah. That's yeah. Yeah. Not bad, not bad. Rub it. Rub it. Now, what do you do if you want to steal a Mona Lisa from the Louvre? You rub it. Rub it. So that's my uh, Yiddish diminutive and very, very accurate rubbing my fortune. So it's ah, ah, ah. Three syllables. I send you ah, ah, two syllables. Ah, ah. Rub it gives Steve his money back. Ready? One, two, three. Rob it! Rob it! Yes, Steve is money back! Perfect. Thank you so much. Ready? Yeah, you got chest. All right. Dismiss, move, eat, drink. Oh. Very good. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That was the idea. Yeah. Yeah. That was the idea. Yeah. Yeah. That was the idea. 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 That I got it. Sometimes beating it. Well, but how? No, no, well, the poem was actually, but the book is uh, a, um, uh, a friend, uh, well, yes, a friend, but uh, she edited it and created it. Yes, uh huh. It's really uh, three and three. Under the boardwalk. The boardwalk is level to shit. Yes. Yeah, 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 right, exactly, right. Well, Barry is in there. Yeah, people can, but 
you know, they have to have the, the stamp of the line. But I go he would let me choose. And I wouldn't so he Yeah, he wasn't healthy. But at any rate Sorry. So there was what? a show oh, yeah. in gas in the Thanks. And then he decided to go to Texas. And this is an Iradia taxi line. Right. So that was that was one of the many errors. So anyway, my grocery. I also like the illustration on your Yeah, book. wonderful. I was looking at that before. Lovely. Yeah. The decision is good. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a, a plate. A oh, yeah. Cigar next to yeah. it. Yeah. Woo! Let's get it. Woo! All right, send it to me or we'll talk on the phone. Okay. 17. Got it. Yeah. Okay, Howard. Thanks. Well, it's 12 to 5. Roughly, 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Your thing, your daughter's thing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. go ask Karen if she still does that. I'm going to ask her. <laughs> uh, Belt's off. Uh, oh, so the pants fell down, right? Not yet? Oh, they were tight. <laughs> they were hugging every inch of me. Take Those pants were happy. <laughs> <laughs> Those pants were saying, oh, Beto, let me stay on a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Whoa. I see it. I see it. I got the visual. Whoa. Back oh, to right. All right. Hey, let it hang low. It <laughs> <laughs> looks like you had a nice little shit. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> There's a wall here. Well, we're still working hard out front, but I wanted to say happy birthday, you guys. Is that Tai Chi? What are you doing? Modern dance? Stripper. Take it off already. Happy birthday, Steve. Thank you for inviting me. Do sit in on that little concert. Okay. I will. When does that happen? Maui. Okay. Okay. In the, uh, Stepped out of the band. Okay. I were really there. like oh, those were there. Go you your Karen's Oh, thing. those were your. No. The pants were up there, and I, and I caressed the crotch of my pants. Oh. You didn't see that? I did. I didn't it. know what you were doing. I'm caressing the crotch of my pants, sister. Oh, excuse me. And I'm enjoying sorry. every minute, and the pants are enjoying every minute of it. Okay. Every we're, second we're of it. trouble. Every nanosecond of it. Okay. We're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> and then I would just... You're already in trouble. What? Let's go what? hear Karen sing. You guys can take Let it on the street. That. You want to hear her sing three songs only. Let's go. Everybody who wants to, I can. Well, not three, just yeah. one. Poor shit. Yes. Oh, I didn't okay. promise her you on the way back. I just said get her. Okay, because she has to I mean, uh... It stands to reason. <laughs> Roger volunteered. Okay. okay. All right, well, Steve wanted me to sing this song for him. And I have another one. I have another one for you, Steve. Whatever you like, Karen. What kind of moon? Yeah, I'm going to do what kind of moon. Here, let's bring it here so I can. I'll bring it here. No. So wrong. It's just a song about Steve. So, it, it, I wrote the song when I was so happy. I 
was actually so in love that I just couldn't even contain it. I just couldn't, I couldn't contain it. So, oops, ah. If I ever and I may never touch the ground.